Welcome in. We're going to show you how to do a complete installation of a flex fuel sensor on a mega squirt system. This is my mate Jance's 1987 BMW 535i that was previously converted to mega squirt. And I want to show you just how simple it is to add a flex fuel sensor if you already have mega squirt installed on your return fuel line going back to the tank. So we've got a pigtail, the flex fuel sensor, and two barbed bundy fittings that slide onto the flex fuel sensor. I have all of the part numbers and a link to a website that you can get these from called Pace Performance, and I will drop that in the description below. So we'll first go over this. Here's the Continental GM brand flex fuel sensor. And these are very common, easy to get. These are 3 8 bundy steel to 5 16 barb fittings that go on the end. And finally, we have the pigtail for the wiring. Another bonus is getting Oedeker clamps. These are a OEM style crimp clamp that you can clamp the hose onto the barbs with if you so desire. The next thing is going over the wiring. This is pre-pulled wire when we did the mega squirt install. Really the flex fuel sensor only needs three wires. It needs a 12 volt, a sensor ground, and the flex fuel sensor input going back to the mega squirt. Down below, right now we're just looking at the hose and where we can find a good spot to mount it. You typically want to mount the flex fuel sensor in a low part of the fuel system so that it can have a pool of fuel around it pretty much at all times. If you mount it vertically, sometimes, especially when you're under high load and you're using a lot of the fuel, it will get air bubbles that go past it. There will not be a constant flow of fuel. So you want to put it in a low part of the system. I find it easiest when you add some sort of lubrication to the end of the barb fitting, especially when using push lock. We are using Continental push lock 5 16 uh, diameter for this and sometimes it'll fight you trying to get it in. So just add a little bit of lubrication right before you try to get these things sunk in. The bigger the push lock typically in my experience, the harder they are to get the fittings in. So with a little bit of lubrication on these makes it a lot easier and it just keeps it from tearing the o-ring that's on the end of the fitting and giving you a hard time getting that fitting in so same goes for both sides of the return fuel line just another reminder this is on the return going back you can plumb these in line on the pressurized side of the fuel system however i find it easier to go on the return and since there's lower pressure you have a little less risk of any of these fittings leaking or causing a flow disruption in comparison to just using the return line going back to the tank. Once you get the fitting snugged in, just make sure to either use a hose clamp or an Oedeker clamp to get those things clamped on permanently so they don't come off. As you can see here, using that Oedeker clamp, really smooth and slick. If you know that the fitting is going to be not removed for a long time or like in this case how the fittings are disc quick disconnect you can use those and then go ahead and find the final resting spot for it in the future we'll be making a plate that this sits on but for now we're just going to use zip ties just to get it in place moving on to the wiring there are three wires that come out of the sensor the sensor just needs 12 volt a sensor ground not a dirty ground or a common ground and the sensor output that goes back to the ecu so now we're just trimming the actual runs from the mega squirt from the car to length, finding a good spot for it, stripping them back a little bit and getting them ready for some heat shrink butt connectors that we'll be using. These back about a quarter of an inch and then twist the braided strands so that they don't fray out when you put them inside the butt connector fittings. These fittings are 20 gauge. You can find them on Amazon or eBay. They're just a heat shrink butt connector and this Carlisle set of pliers that is a stripper and a crimper combo is amazing. 
I highly suggest them. A lot of different companies make similar tools like this. I'll try to find one and put it in the description below, but they're one of my favorite for simple butt connector crimps and a lot of wire stripping and things like that that you would do on a project similar to this. The pink wire on the end of the sensor right here is for power and the white with a black stripe is for sensor ground and then the white wire on the end there is for the output to the mega squirt for the actual flex fuel output. Just make sure that you have a sensor ground and not a chassis ground for this. Once you have everything crimped up, just go ahead and heat shrink it down. You can use a simple heat gun or a lot of the times I've used a lighter and just got the flame close to these fittings just to get the heat shrink to crimp down all the way. Make sure you put enough heat on them so that they're fully sealed off so in case you wash your engine bay or any water things get close to it, it'll be completely sealed off. And then once you finish this, it's time to put some wire loom on there. In this case, we've used some split loom. I think you can find this one pretty easily off Amazon or eBay. Since it's on a side of the motor that will not be getting a lot of heat, this is suitable, even though it's not actually a fire rated style. You can find fire rated styles. They're significantly more expensive, but this is on the colder side of the motor and away from the exhaust and a lot of the major heat components of the engine. So I found this one to be suitable after using it for a few different years. I can give you a link in the description for some on Amazon or eBay, but you just simply open the split part of the loom and feed the wires down inside of it. Another pro tip, if you don't want all of these connectors to be bunched up in one area, you can stagger them. So the width of each of these butt connectors you can just stagger down each wire so each wire progressively is cut longer and or shorter on each side but in this case it wasn't too big of a deal this loom reaches over it and we just put a little bit of loom tape just around the ends and that bulge where those fittings were lastly apply just a little bit of oil to the steel fittings so that when you click into the bundy fittings you don't damage the o-rings the quick disconnect fittings that go onto the steel part of this sensor have o-rings down inside of it and it is best practice to not push dry metal against the o-rings if you want them to last very long so just as a safety precaution i always put just a touch of lubrication on those before we click them in as you can see really slick once you get these fittings crimped on it is just simply pushing these Bundy fittings on and once you hear them click they're completely sealed and ready to go you typically unless you have a manufactured defect won't have any issues once these guys clip in over the end there just trying to find the best routing I think that's one of the most difficult parts of modifying an old car is there's so many different things in the engine bay Sometimes just finding a decent route for things is kind of tricky. So just take your time, find a route that won't get in the way of any of the moving parts or won't get in the way if the motor flexes. And after you've clicked in the connector there, we're gonna go to the inside of the car and get this thing set up. A couple of quick zip ties to keep it in place. And as all professionals would do, you clip the ends of the zip ties. <laughs> So here we go. We'll jump into the car now and get this thing set up on the Mega Squirt. All right, so we're just gonna hook into the Mega Squirt now. We'll do the update later because it'll still run fine just like this. USB is in and we'll click on a project. Then just turn it to you on. Cool, you can see it's connected. Everything's getting a reading. Everything should be wired up so now all we need to do is go into um, our flex settings. So under fuel settings, fuel sensor settings, just click this and we're gonna enable it. It's already wired up. It's using the flex wire as the input and uh, it's gonna require a restart to burn. The biggest thing that we're gonna have to change right here is the 
ethanol mix, there's a baseline down here at the bottom. And I go over this in another video, but most gasoline in North America has eight to 10%. And so when you just go fill up at, I don't know, any of the gas stations like Texaco or um, Chevron, it's gonna have about 8%. So we wanna give an 8% baseline so it doesn't change your fuel table. Basically that just makes it so the gas that's in your tank right now won't modify the fuel settings in any way. And then on additional timing for E85, we're just gonna zero that out. We're just gonna make sure that everything, as far as timing and ignition changes, are zeroed out. Just make sure that's good and hit burn. This is a big enough change that it is going to require a um, power cycle. So we're just gonna power cycle the, we'll just power cycle the ECU. You can go ahead and shut it off. And you can turn it back up. Okay, cool. And what we'll probably do right now is just change this to E85 correction. If you go to E85 correction and it's at 100%, that means that right now it's seeing no difference to compared to your baseline fuel. So you're getting your exact same settings from your fuel table right here. So it'll just take your fuel table as you've tuned it previously. Um, all right, so what you can do is right click on the gauge to change what the gauge output is. So if you go to sensor inputs and ethanol content, this is the actual percentage of ethanol in your fuel currently. It's floating between nine and 10%. And like I said, most fuel in North America is between eight and 10% ethanol content. You wanna just get your settings in the flex fuel as close on the baseline setting to what the actual fuel you're getting is as possible. If it's within a percent or two, it won't make a huge difference, especially like within 1%. But since we're actually closer to uh, nine and 10, I, I put in eight as the default, but we'll just go back into the flex settings and change this to nine. And that'll split the difference between fuel that has a little less and a little more. I think it'll be pretty good. As well as this, you can just go in, save the tune again after you do that. And you can see it hovering around there. We'll just go into calculations and go back to E85 fuel correction and see how it's at 100%. That means that it's not changing your fuel map at all until we add more ethanol. But you just wanna get your fuel setting, the baseline amount of ethanol to match up to the, the amount of ethanol in your typical pump gas that you use. So that should be it. All right, so we just put in about a little over half a tank of V85. And now we're gonna fire it up and see what our E85 percentage is. I'll change it. Uh, here, one sec, we'll go to sensor inputs two. Oh, if I can get the trackpad to work. Ethanol percentage, all right, now fire it up. I'll just let it, okay. And you'll watch this percentage come up. Okay, you can fire it up. And it will take a minute just to come through. Typically does, but you'll just watch it go from 10 and then it will usually get a whiff of the good stuff coming through the line and it just jumps up 15, 17. Yep, there we go. I guess it'll be in the 30s somewhere. There we go. Yeah, perfect. So around 30, almost 40%. And it will probably still keep mixing for just a minute. You see it's going up to slightly 38%. 39, it'll probably rest around 40. It's just the tank's got to mix in pretty good, so. 